All right, guys, welcome to chapter five, part two. I broke up migration because there was a lot of information. Um, so this is just the second part of chapter five. So again, remember that unit two covers chapters three and four, which are on population, and chapter five, which is on migration. Reversing historical trends. Since the mid 20th century, which would be the 1900s, migration flows have changed. So starting around 1950, we really start to see changes happen. Europe, once a region people were leaving, is now a destination for migrants from around the world. So if you guys think of like the United States as a perfect example of this, in the 1800s, it was mainly people from Europe who were migrating here. But since 1950, hardly any Europeans migrate to the US. That's because Europe's population has now stopped growing and they're highly developed. So now Europeans don't want to leave Europe. Instead, people from other regions want to go to Europe. Many people moving to Europe come from former European colonies in the Middle East, South Asia, and West Africa for many reasons, including that many of them can speak European languages because of the colonial history, and also because of levels of development and because those countries' populations are growing. These immigrants are usually seeking jobs as guest workers or to unify with family members who have already come to these European countries. Turkey threatened to send 15,000 refugees a month to Europe. So Turkey is really kind of the gatekeeper to Europe, as you can see from the geography of where it's located. So many of the migrants from the Middle East have to go through Turkey in order to get to Europe. The migration to Europe is one example of a global pattern known as chain migration, which is when people move to communities where relatives or friends have migrated previously. As a result of chain migration, a single immigrant admitted to the US has the potential to bring over large numbers of foreign relatives. And in fact, US policy has been to allow for chain migration to happen. Chain migration increases migrant streams from one area to another as a result of kinship links or other social and political connections, which is why we end up with these ethnic enclaves or ethnic neighborhoods within cities and within parts of the country. So we know in the 1800s, a lot of Italians specifically moved to cities like Boston and New York, which is why there's Little Italy's there, because there was Italians who were already living there. So again, as a result, this formation of these ethnic enclaves or neighborhoods, which are filled primarily with people of the same ethnic group, have happened in cities across the U.S. Here's a map showing the different ethnic neighborhoods around Sydney, Australia. And as you can see, all of these different uh, groups have settled in different parts of Sydney because they want to be around people who share the same culture and uh, history as them. Another famous example of this is Chinatown. The biggest in the United States are found in New York and San Francisco. Historical trends in the US. The United States has experienced several trends in immigration and forced migration from other countries. Between 1500 and 1700, European countries raced to colonize North America. By 1700, North America had been claimed primarily by England, France, and Spain. And you can see the different European colonies on this map. However, major sources of migrants entering the United States have shifted over time. The Atlantic slave trade saw uh, millions of enslaved Africans forced to the Americas. Most actually ended up in the Caribbean and South America, but lots here in North America as well between 1600s and 1808. The first big wave of European migrants came from Northern and Western Europe. You definitely need to know the regions of the world. So Northern and Western Europe would be countries like the UK and Germany and France. Those are part of Northern and Western Europe. We said though, since about 1950, Europeans really haven't left Europe much because Europe is now highly developed and their population has stopped growing. Instead, what we've seen since 1950 is Latin American and Asian immigrants to the US. 
Here you can see the number of migrants from various different places between 1880 and 1930. We see during this time period, we see a lot from Italy, also the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which would mainly be Germans. We see a lot of Russians. We see uh, people from England, Canada, Ireland, and Sweden would be the main people who were coming over here prior to the 1930s. Migration policies and their consequences. While some countries around the world have encouraged immigrants, others have actively restricted the flow of migration into their countries. Many countries have largely relied on immigrants to improve their economies. And in fact, highly developed countries really have a need for immigrants for multiple reasons. One reason is because of our populations. We already know in highly developed countries, their populations are starting to decline, which means they have too many old people and not enough workers. So they really need immigrants to fill in those working spots. Also in highly developed countries, most of the population is highly educated and they don't want to do those low skilled, low paid types of jobs. So they need immigrants to come in and fill those types of jobs. However, even though there is a need for immigrants in highly developed countries, many people have cultural and political biases against immigrants and try to keep them out. And this is not a new phenomenon. This has actually been a common thread throughout US history. Whoever the largest group was that was coming in was discriminated against. When that was the Irish, it was true. When it was the Italians, it was true. Today being with the uh, Hispanics, it is still true. Policies encouraging immigration. Until the 1880s, the United States government placed few restrictions on immigration. Basically, if you could get here, you could stay. The ratio of farmland to the number of people to work it was high, so immigrants were often welcome. One U.S. policy that attracted immigrants was known as the Homestead Act. It was a program in which the U.S. government gave land to settlers willing to stay and farm it for five years. After your five years, the land became the property of the settler. Currently, the U.S. government offers visas to migrants who are well-educated, hoping to get them to remain in the country. Permanent resident applications are also referred to as green card cases or immigrant visa petitions. Many countries have guest worker programs to attract immigrants to do hard, unpleasant work. We have already talked about how in countries like the UAE, they have a ton of males 20 years old to 40, and most of those are guest workers from places like India and Bangladesh. In places like France, most of their guest workers come from North Africa, countries like Algeria. Here in the US, most of our guest workers come from Mexico. So it really has to do with geography so uh, the closest kind of less developed country near the highly developed country is usually where the guest workers are going to come from. Here we see a list of the types of jobs that many of these immigrants take. Here in the US and Europe, agriculture is a huge one. Most of the produce that you have that you eat is picked by immigrant workers. These programs allow the immigrants to improve their fortunes in their new countries. While most people don't want to do these types of jobs in our country, it's actually more money than they would make in their home countries, which is why they're willing to do the work. Most countries have family reunification policies, allowing the migrants to sponsor family members to migrate to the country. Other policies include allowing refugees to migrate quickly in emergency situations and allowing foreign college students an easy pathway to become permanent residents after they graduate. Policies discouraging immigration. Countries often pass laws to restrict immigration. They can make entering the country difficult by establishing educational standards for immigrants or by restricting the type of work immigrants can do or countries can simply set a quota to limit the number of people allowed to enter the country legally. Some policies to restrict immigration reflect xenophobia, which is a strong dislike of people who practice another culture. Other restrictions are based in economics. People fear that immigrants will take their jobs. 
In the United States, xenophobia and economic fears combined to prompt Congress to pass laws that banned nearly all immigration from China between 1882 and 1943. This was known as the Chinese Exclusion Act. Countries sometimes restrict immigration primarily in an attempt to preserve their own cultural homogeny. Japan is a great example of this. Japan hardly allows in any immigrants, even though they actually need it because their population is declining because they are obsessed with preserving their culture. So because of this policy and uh, Japan's geography of being an isolated island country, the people of Japan form one of the most ethnically similar countries in the world. And we'll talk about this in a later unit, but they're really the best example of what we call a nation state, where everybody in the country is pretty much the same ethnic group, they speak the same language and so forth. So again, Japan maintains this by sharply limiting immigration, even though its population pyramid indicates that it faces a shortage of working age people and would actually benefit tremendously economically from immigration. Effects of migration. There are several effects, both positive and negative, that migration has on the countries of origin as well as the destination countries. Effects include ones that are demographic, economic, cultural, and political. One positive effect of the countries of origin is relief from overcrowding. We know most of the countries people are leaving are usually stage two of the demographic transition, which means their populations are growing rapidly. So it's a good thing for those countries if people leave because they face overpopulation. When countries have too many people, opportunities are scarce. As migrants leave in search of better lives, overcrowding problems are lessened. Zelensky's migration transition model helps explain this effect. Because of high population growth in stages two and three countries, people usually will migrate to countries that are in stages four or five. Migration can also have negative effects on the places people are leaving. If the working age people leave, the area of migration is left with a population skewed toward the elderly and children. Economically, this creates a dependency ratio problem because you have to take care of old people and children and you need that working age group to do so. We see this dependency ratio problem, especially in Europe. As you can see, the Eastern European countries are going to have the biggest problem with this, with too many old people and not enough working age people. Right now, you see about five workers per elderly person, which means those five people's taxes are being able to help support that one elderly person. But by 2060, it's only going to be about two people per elderly person, which means a lot less tax money is being collected to help support those older people. Culturally, it can undercut the traditional family structure. Both of these have occurred during China's rural to urban migration, which is the largest migration within a country ever in history. So again, I wanna make sure you guys understand that when we talk about China's internal migration, it's not from west to east. The population has always lived in the east, but it's from the rural east to the urban east. So from the, the, the farmland to the city. When migration out of a country is made up of many highly skilled people, it is called a brain drain. So when the highly talented people from a country leave and they move to a different country, that's brain drain. A good example of brain drain happened in Germany before and after World War II. After World War II, Germany had been split into West Germany controlled by the Allies, including the US, and East Germany controlled by the Soviet Union. By the 1950s, West Germany was heading towards a model of industrialized society, while the East was becoming infamous for its oppressive regimes and human rights abuses. Frustrated, the people from the East started migrating to the West. Most of them were young and trained professionals, which is why it's considered a brain drain. Because of this, the East German government closed its border, but it could not tackle immigration through West Berlin. To tackle the brain drain and decreasing population, on midnight August 12, 1961, East Germans started building the Berlin Wall, which would divide the city for three decades.
Today, students from around the world enter the United States or Great Britain to study medicine, engineering, or other fields, and many decide to stay rather than return to their land of birth. This creates a brain drain on their countries of origin. A recent United Nations report found that about 11% of Africans with graduate or professional degrees were living in the United States, Europe, or other highly developed countries. Effects on receiving countries. Countries receiving immigrants usually benefit greatly. Immigrants make cultural contributions to their new countries, including new foods, new words and languages, diverse forms of entertainment, and a variety of religious traditions. Here are Haitian drummers at a Haitian American book fair in Miami. In addition, because most immigrants want to better their economic situations, they are highly motivated to get an education, work hard, and succeed. Many immigrants start businesses. And many immigrants often start small with labor intensive businesses such as restaurants, nail salons, and other service oriented enterprises. But not all of these businesses stay small. Nearly 200 of the 500 largest businesses in the world were started by immigrants or their children. Since immigrants generally move from poorer regions to wealthier ones, they often can afford to make remittances, money they send to their family and friends in the country they left. You can see from this map of remittances from the US that Mexico, China, India, the Philippines, these countries um, are receiving the most remittances from uh, their relatives who live here and work here in the United States. Remittances help the individuals receiving them and account for nearly 40% of the income of some small countries, such as Central Asian countries of Ch Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. According to the World Bank, the United States and Saudi Arabia are among the leading countries as origins of remittance. India and China are often leading countries as recipients of the remittances. While immigration is usually very good for the countries that are receiving immigrants, a lot of times this can also cause conflict, and the conflict arises between immigrants and native-born citizens. Two groups might clash over religious beliefs, cultural practices, or access to jobs. Countries sometimes pass laws and businesses follow practices that discriminate against immigrants. One example of this is in France, which recently passed laws banning face coverings. So that doesn't mean that they banned all types of uh, Muslim uh, head coverings. It just means they banned certain types that cover the face. So as you can see, there are different types. Um, the hijab obviously would be okay. Um, the burqa, not so much. Case study, the USA. Migration from Mexico to the United States of America primarily involves the movement of Mexicans from Mexico to the southern states of America, which border Mexico. So that would be California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. In order to gain access to America, Mexicans must cross the United States-Mexico border, a border which spans four U.S. states and six Mexican states. In America, it starts in California and ends in Texas. Due to their proximity to the border and the high availability of work in these states, the majority of Mexicans moved to California, followed second by Texas. California currently houses over 11 million immigrants, with Texas holding almost 8 million. Many Mexicans from rural communities in Mexico migrate to the U.S. The majority being males who move to America and then send remittances, that money, back to their families in Mexico. Many of these immigrants enter the country illegally because it takes too much time and too much paperwork to do it legally, which often requires them to cross a large desert that separates Mexico and the U.S. and also the Rio Grande River. 
Since the 1990s and 2000s, the U.S. has built fencing along the U.S.-Mexico border in the highly populated places near large cities. So don't think that this wall is brand new. There has been this fencing since the 1990s. And in fact, most of what has been built in the last couple of years is really just replacing the fence that already exists, which means that migrants are mainly going into these very, very rural parts of the desert to cross where there is not a fence. This is what actually makes the crossing so dangerous because many people end up dehydrated and die in the desert from this dangerous crossing. These journeys are dangerous and many immigrants have died or nearly died trying to cross into America through these routes. This map shows illegal immigrants that died in the Arizona desert since 2001. Reasons for migration, push factors. There are incredibly high crime rates in Mexico and other parts of Latin America. Here we see homicide cases and rates in Mexico between 1997 and 2011. And as you can see, there's been a recent increase in uh, this type of violent crime. Homicide rates come in at around 10 to 14 per 100,000 people, um, which is around the world average, and drug-related crimes are also a major concern. Some parts of Mexico have become so dangerous that the U.S. State Department advises Americans to not even travel there. It's thought that in the past five years, over 47,000 people have been killed in crimes relating to drugs in Mexico. Many Mexicans and in other countries in Latin America, especially places like Honduras and Guatemala, will move out of fear for their lives and hope that America is a more stable place to live with lower crime rates. Unemployment and poverty, though, is the main reason why people move from Mexico. It's a major problem and has risen exponentially in recent years. In the year 2000, unemployment rates in Mexico were at 2.2%. However, in 2009, they rose by 34.43%. A large portion of the Mexican population is farmers living in rural areas where extreme temperature and poor quality of land make it difficult to actually farm. This is causing many Mexican families to struggle, with 47% of the population living under the poverty line. And as you can see, it's actually southern Mexico, uh, which has the highest uh, poverty. And so what we see is uh, these people from southern Mexican states moving north into northern Mexico and also into the United States in hopes of a better life. With these high unemployment and poverty rates, people are forced to move to the U.S. where they have better prospects. The climate and natural hazards in Mexico also uh, force or push people to move to the U.S. Most of Mexico is very arid, which suffers from water shortages, even in the more developed areas of Mexico. The country also suffers from natural disasters, including volcanoes, earthquakes, hurricanes, and tsunamis. Recent natural disasters could force people to migrate if their homes have been destroyed or made uninhabitable. People who live in danger zones could also migrate out of fear for their lives. Reasons for migration pull factors. There's a noticeable difference in the quality of life between the U.S. and Mexico. 
Poverty, as mentioned before, is a major issue in Mexico, with 6% of the population lacking access to drinking water. Mexico's infrastructure is also severely undeveloped when compared to the U.S. Despite being the 11th richest country in the world, Mexico has the 10th highest poverty. With the U.S. offering significantly better living standards and services, such as healthcare and schools, people are enticed to move to the U.S. for a better life. Existing migrant communities in states such as Texas and California also help to pull people towards migration, knowing that there's already a large culture of uh, their same people here. Here's a map of the largest Hispanic populations in the U.S. Existing communities make it easier for people to settle once moved and family members and friends who have already moved can encourage others to move. Of the Mexican population, 86.1% are literate versus 99% of the population in the U.S. In addition, the majority of students in Mexico finish school at the age of 14 versus 16 in the U.S. These statistics show there is a significantly better academic opportunities in the U.S. than in Mexico, which can entice Mexicans to migrate for an improved education, either for themselves or more likely their future children. Assimilation of Mexicans into American communities has also been problematic. Many Mexicans can't speak fluent English, and studies show their ability to speak English doesn't necessarily improve drastically while they live in the U.S. And part of this is because they do purposely live in communities with other people from Mexico. So again, this is largely due to them living in closed communities of other Mexican immigrants, which reduces their need to assimilate with America. And this isn't the first time this has been true. This was actually also true in places like Little Italy in the 1800s, where most of the original Italian immigrants also didn't assimilate very well, and most of them just continue to speak Italian. In turn, this uh, can create tension between migrants and locals, which can, in extreme cases, lead to segregation, crime, and violence. There are also concerns that immigrants are increasing crime rates in areas they migrate to. Again, this has been a common thread throughout U.S. history. It's really not the fact that they're immigrants, though. It's the fact that in all low-income and poor education neighborhoods, you're going to find uh, factors that lead to crime. So in addition, as Mexico is a country associated with drug trafficking, there are concerns that Mexican migrants could possibly be smuggling drugs into the U.S. The introduction of Mexican cultural traditions to the U.S., especially in states with large number of migrants, have helped to improve cultural aspects of those states. Mexican-themed food has become incredibly popular in the U.S., with burritos and taco fast food shops opening up across the country. The new food and music has helped to improve the cultural diversity of the U.S. significantly. With such a large number of Mexican migrants not speaking English fluently, it's now common for Spanish to be taught in American schools, widening the skill set of the younger population and improving the potential career opportunities that students may have. With so many young people leaving Mexico, it's developing an increasingly dependent population as the majority of people left are the elderly who cannot work. Furthermore, the lack of young fertile couples is reducing the birth rate in Mexico, further increasing the dependency ratio as there's no workforce to pay taxes to support the elderly. Migrants work at incredibly low wages. Americans who are desperate for work are now often expected to work at these low wages too, which they can't afford to do, leading to increased poverty in the U.S. Many companies are now also replacing American labor with cheaper migrant labor, also increasing unemployment rates as people are forced out of their jobs. Unfortunately, the majority of migrants come from rural areas, leaving a shortage of farmers and, therefore, the potential for food shortages in Mexico as the economically active people from rural areas leave. Case study, Calcutta, India.
Reasons for rural to urban migration. Large population growth in rural areas puts more pressure on the environment. Higher wages in Calcutta are approximately six times that of the rural areas. Because of a growing population, subdivision of land passed on makes a subsistence life more difficult and reduces the assets against which a rural inhabitant could get a loan. Think about this. If your family has a 10 acre farm and then your parents have 10 kids, each kid only gets one acre and that's not going to be enough to support that kid and that kid's family. Land holding size is halved every 20 to 30 years due to subdivision of land holdings because of population growth. The subdivision is caused by the equal sharing among sons at the time of inheritance. Increased mechanization of agriculture to feed growing population means greater rural unemployment because you don't need as many farmers. A large number of migrants are a consequence of natural disasters, such as those faced annually in the monsoon season. Indian cities receive approximately six times the investment of their rural counterparts, which is going to lead to better education, better medical and health care. So infant mortality is lower in Indian cities than in rural areas. Consequences for the area they arrive in. The first is a chance to escape the rigid caste system that's still very strong in rural areas. The caste system is technically illegal in India, and in fact, in most of the cities, it doesn't play as strong of a role. But in the rural areas, in the villages, it does still play a strong role. So a chance to escape that um, is one of the pulls to the city. Rural communities were long arranged on the basis of castes. The upper and lower castes almost always lived in segregated colonies, and the water wells are not shared, and one could only marry within one's caste. The second effect that this large rural to urban migration has had on Calcutta is a half a million people sleeping on the streets um, or sleeping in any places that they can. So we see the growth of what are known as slums um, in these places. The third effect is an increased air pollution as the pressures of population create a need for more industry. In addition, many Indian households don't have electricity, so people still use wood and charcoal for cooking. Because of the rapid population growth from rural to urban migration, the old water system cannot cope. Leaking pipes allow contamination to enter the water supply. Increased traffic also creates greater air pollution problems. As many as 60% of the population suffer from breathing problems because of the pollution. Busties or slums or these illegal squatter, squatter settlements have to occupy the least desirable land. Alternatively, the developments, these slum developments, could be on steep slopes, increasing the chances of landslides. Consequences for the area they leave. If the migrant finds work in the city, then it's likely that the village he left will benefit from the remittance, again, the money he'll send home. As the pressures of urbanization increase, government expenditure on urban areas increases, leaving the rural areas facing an ever more difficult situation. Lack of investment of health and welfare will have obvious effects on those left behind in the rural villages. Just like Ravenstein said, it's the young male that is most likely to leave. That has implications for those left behind. They will be predominantly elderly population that will find it ever more difficult to support themselves.
Whilst migration may ease some of the population pressures, the high birth rates in rural areas means the situation is deteriorating. This means a constant loss through migration with the breakup of families. Consequences for the migrant. Many of these rural to urban migrants come and they're not skilled. They don't have uh, any work. And so they're forced to live in these slums or busties. Often the only work available is in the informal sector. Jobs here can include rummaging amongst rubbish to find materials that could be sold for recycling. Many migrants often feel forced to stay in the cities, not wanting to face the failure of going home. And that concludes uh, our unit two notes. So that was chapter five, uh, migration causes and consequences. So again, your unit two tests will include chapter three, four, and five, population and migration. Thank you.